Kia ora, good evening. I'm Simon Henderson. A showdown between Gore District Councillors and Mayor Ben Bell came to a somewhat peaceful end this week at an extraordinary council meeting. Seven councillors had requested the meeting, including a vote of no confidence in the Mayor, but a last-minute deal has given hopes of working together. Celebrations at the Gore District Council Chamber as a vote of no confidence in Mayor Ben Bell was abandoned. A large crowd of protesters had gathered outside before the extraordinary council meeting, which followed months of drama and clashes at the council. Seven councillors claimed they'd lost trust and confidence in Mayor Bell, but both groups met late yesterday to hammer out a compromise deal. Members asking for help in putting the issue behind them and working together. I would like to move that the council work with local government New Zealand and Taitara to develop an amended terms of reference for an independent review to restore confidence in the council. Councils were unanimous in support, saying they need to return to the Gore way and get on with the job for the good of the community. I can see the potential here to build a bloody good team of people to do a bloody good job. Mayor Bell also supporting the motion, saying the council needs the skills to help them. We've all made mistakes and we're at the point now where we need some desperate help from the, the professionals, the people who do this day in and day out, to help us out to manoeuvre through this. But Bell admitted the calls to resign had a major impact on the young politician. I think getting the request to resign was, was probably two of the darkest days of my life. Um, it was incredibly hard, it was incredibly stressful. Despite seven councillors having asked for a vote of no confidence ahead of the meeting, none were interested in supporting the motion on the day. Then we shall move on if there is no further discussion. The motion for Mayor Bell to be removed from nine council committees also lapsed, with no supporters for the move. However, the Mayor will step away from the CEO appraisal committee, along with Councillor McPhail, who's been acting as a mediator between the Mayor and Steve Parry. Ben Bell ending the meeting on a light-hearted note, signalling the council wants to get back to the nitty-gritty of running Gore. If you want to stick around and hear about our bridge project, or uh, innovative streets, or... Uh, all sorts of other things that we'll be discussing, feel free to rejoin us at 4pm, but this meeting is officially closed. Thank you very much. In Gore, the South today. It's the end of an era for an iconic Southland business chain. Invercargill residents were stunned to wake up to news that department store H&J Smith was planning to close its doors after more than 120 years of business. A shock for the Southland community. After 123 years of business, it's almost closing time for H&J Smith. The iconic department store chain is shutting up shop, leaving behind a century of retail legacy in Southland and 220 staff out of work. Group Managing Director Jason Smith announced the proposal to call time on the company's remaining stores in Invercargill, Gore and Queenstown. He says it's been an honour to serve the community from as far back as his great-grandfather who started the business. It's like a dark cloud has entered our building, I think it's probably the nicest way to put it. Um, there's a lot of people who've worked with us many years uh, and they are really, really hurting today. One major issue was a need for significant earthquake strengthening at the company's flagship 12,000 square metre store in Invercargill. But there's been a lot of pressure on the business. Smith says supplier constraints, COVID-19 and limits on reinvestment have taken their toll in recent years, with changes in global retail meaning the department store's no longer a sustainable enough model to meet those costs. The business previously closed its Dunedin, Mosgiel, Balclutha and Tiano stores in 2020, but Invercargill's locals are very sad to see the end in sight. It's very gutting. I thought and Jay Smith should be there forever, you know. It's a shame because it's pretty good for the community. Good shop, uh, lots of good bargains in it. I mean, your feeling's got to go out for the staff, really, more than anything. I mean, it's an iconic store here, so it would be a shame to lose a piece of our history. Yeah, it was a bit of a shock to hear it this morning, and it would be quite sad if it does close. It's been around for all of my life, and everybody else in Southland's lives, I guess. It's just part of the fabric here. Closing the stores would see around 200 staff losing their jobs in Invercargill, with another 20 in Queenstown and four staff in Gore. However, the company's CEO says they're handling the news well. They're in remarkably good shape. They're incredibly to be stoic. This place is a village. Um, we promote that imagery because they've got each other's back. The proposal now moves into a four-week consultation process as the company figures out the next steps for the H&J Smith Group. A final decision is expected by late June. In Invercargill, the South Today.
And now the derelict Dunedin building is at the centre of attention, but one Dunedin City Councillor is trying to save it. David Benson Pope is continuing his mission to hold property owners accountable to prevent empty buildings from falling into disrepair. Another neglected building, close to Dunedin CBD. This building at the intersection of Mant Street and Broadway was previously an antique trader's, but has been lying empty for years. Dunedin City Councillor David Benson Pope wants the council to make it more difficult for property owners to neglect buildings, which get to the state where demolition is the only option. Looking at a building like this and a few others around the place, I don't need much more evidence of the need to get this done. It's just one of a number of rundown buildings near the city centre. His call follows a decision to mark this row of buildings in Prince's Street for demolition, after years of debate. The former Arkwright's building is owned by the fabled Dunedin Hotel, located just next door, with its entrance on Prince's Street. It's just an embarrassment to the city that a good corporate citizen like those hoteliers um, are prepared to sit with a building like this on the corner and not actually fix it up. At a committee meeting on Monday, Benson Pope suggested council staff investigate the costs and benefits of using the Building Act to address the issue of demolition by neglect. His motion passed unanimously, although councillors were told the real power lies with central government. In Dunedin, the South today. There's a somewhat deflated mood in Wanaka despite a smooth liftoff last weekend from the local airport. NASA had short-lived triumph with their latest super-pressure balloon launch, which developed a leak just over a day in flight. A giant balloon towering over trucks on the tarmac at Wanaka Airport. NASA's team successfully launched their latest super-pressure balloon on Saturday, but the smooth start to the mission was short-lived. The balloon developed a leak just over a day into the flight, which forced the mission to be terminated early. It was the second balloon launched by NASA from the small airport this year, with the initial success a big achievement. It's the first time we've ever done it in the history of the program to have two super pressures in, the, in flight at one time. It's been a long time making. The giant balloon was launched just after midday on Saturday, climbing upwards at more than 300 metres a minute. Once inflated to the size of a sports stadium, onboard equipment was ready to detect high-energy cosmic ray particles in Earth's atmosphere from beyond the Milky Way. The uh, USO mission is looking for high-energy uh, cosmic rays, extra extragalactic, so outside the galaxy, high-energy cosmic rays, because uh, there's not a lot known about those, the sources of them, where they come from, so that's what it's trying to study. The NASA balloon program gives scientists, researchers and engineers a chance to test out equipment without actually going into space. Okay, but yeah. it's not just NASA who've benefited from the Wanaka-based missions. Look, at it, for the community, it's amazing. Um, the fact that it brings in a huge amount of, of um, revenue for, for Wanaka itself. But for the airport, I think it, it puts a lot of focus on, on us. And, and what we do here, which is great. The balloon was set to circumnavigate the Earth for 100 days. But sadly, after just over a day in flight, the balloon carrying the space observatory developed a leak, forcing controllers to terminate its journey over the Pacific Ocean. NASA will investigate the cause of the issue. In Wanaka, the South Today. FI Akine, still to come on Southern Newsweek. Otago University researchers may have managed to cure one lady's blindness through an accidental miracle. Wanaka is soaring. A new study reveals just how much the small airport is worth to the community. Welcome back. A research study treating lower back pain may also have accidentally cured a case of blindness in a surprise twist of fate. The vision of one Dunedin woman has returned after being treated with electrical currents, with doctors calling it an accidental miracle. This setup looks like something out of a sci-fi movie, but Lindley Hood is at the forefront of medical research. The Dunedin author had suffered from a rare form of glaucoma for more than a decade, causing her vision to be seriously impaired. Hood had countless doctor's appointments about the loss of central vision in her left eye, but was told the damage was already done. I was given the message that once you get a serious eye disorder, it's not going to get better. 
we'd just try and sort of stop it getting worse. After fracturing her pelvis in a fall at home, she decided to take part in an Otago University research study to treat lower back pain. The study involved sending electrical currents to stimulate the brain. Hood was part of the placebo group, which saw electrical currents only sent through the scalp. But to her surprise and delight, the brain stimulation sessions improved her eyesight, shocking friends when they went out for brunch. I made my order and Elizabeth said, Lindley, can you read that menu? And so I said, yeah, I think my sight's improved. Even the researchers and doctors are amazed, calling it an accidental miracle. She received uh, a placebo stimulation. So that's where we are a little bit surprised um, and we want to investigate this further. Researchers found the currents travelled into the retinal cells of Hood's eyes, sending messages to the visual part of the brain. The research team is now planning a new study to investigate how brain stimulation might help improve low vision for other people. In Dunedin, the South Today. Wanaka is getting ready to fly high. That's according to a new study which revealed the town's small airport generates almost $70 million for the local economy. A scenic landing for planes in central Otago. And now an independent study has revealed just how important Wanaka Airport is to the local economy. It found the airport and its businesses generate a whopping $69.6 million for Wanaka's economy. And that's only set to climb, with almost three quarters of businesses here forecasting growth. The survey was conducted by the Wanaka Airport Users Group to help understand the value of the small airport to the wider community outside of the popular Warbirds International Air Show. It really surprised us in that there's 147 full-time staff work here at the airport. The turnover of all the businesses is nearly $70 million. The airport hosts 11 businesses, collectively employing almost 150 people. Grant says $9.3 million is paid in workers' salaries, much of which gets pumped straight back into the Wanaka economy. We've got a great asset here, and a lot of people in Wanaka don't know anything about it. So let's broadcast that. Let's, let's celebrate the community in Wanaka at the airport. The airport's currently still designated as rural land. That's an area the Wanaka Airport Users Group is trying to change. Designating it as an airport would allow for more hangars for the three quarters of businesses wanting to expand. They're hoping to work with the airport's owner, Queenstown Lakes District Council and the Queenstown Airport Corporation to create a vibrant community-focused airport. In Wanaka, the South today. Dunedin woman Pip Milford Hughes has won gold in the shape of a balloon trophy. The balloonologist took home the top prize in TV3's reality show Blow Up, celebrating alongside friends and family at a public viewing party. Celebrating with some very appropriate gold trophies. Balloonologist Pip Milford Hughes is flying high after winning the final of 3's reality TV show Blow Up but the TV show itself was filmed last December, meaning she's had to keep tight-lipped about the competition and results. She was relieved the happy secret is now out, after last night's final episode screened on Tuesday night. Oh, yes. It's been a really hard secret to keep, and um, some people are really clever at trying to um, get it out of you, but um, I have held fast. <laughs> The Dunedin resident goes by the name Pippity Pop when she's on the job and took home $25,000 and the special balloon-shaped trophy. Each episode of the blow-up show featured a different themed challenge, contestants tasked with creating colourful balloon sculptures under a time crunch. But for Pippity Pop, one particular challenge really stood out. Absolutely love the balloon dresses, couldn't believe that we had, none of us had made a dress before and then for them to actually be worn by professional models, just amazing. She enjoyed sharing the emotions of the win last night with family, friends and supporters. Tehura Otago Museum hosted a special public screening party of the final episode with a large crowd turning out to celebrate Dunedin's blow-up champion. I'm absolutely wrapped and I'm so proud, really proud. 
Pippity Pop says the experience has taught her better time management and speed twisting balloons and believes the show has boosted the credibility of the balloon twisting community. In Dunedin, the South Today. Former rugby superstars were among the people taking to the rural streets on two wheels, cycling from Queenstown to Invercargill for charity. The annual Westpac Chopper Appeal bike ride saw many braving the long journey, making it a record-breaking year for the event. Rolling along the country roads like a royal cavalcade, 75 cyclists took part in the annual Westpac Chopper Appeal bike ride on Friday, cycling 250 kilometres from Queenstown to Invercargill. Among the crowd, some familiar faces. Former All Blacks captain Richie McCaw was joined by his 2011 World Cup teammates Mills Milliaina and Southland's own Jimmy Cowan. Yeah, it was a, a cold start, a bit of snow around, but uh, yeah, we got through that. But no, it was a amazing experience stopping off at uh, a couple of schools and yeah, having people out and about, uh, which is you know, keep us calm, it was brilliant, so uh, yeah, no, we had a great day. McCaw says he enjoyed his first shot at the challenge, and he's keen to give it another go in future. The former All Blacks weren't the only riders sticking out in the crowd. 17-year-old Kennedy Taylor wasn't going to let anything get in the way of the day's events. Well, I biked from Queensland to Lumsden, and then my mum picked me up, and yeah, when I got ready, and now I've got my ball tonight. <laughs> The ride left Queenstown at about half past five in the morning, and 12 hours later the worn-out cyclists arrived in Invercargill to the applause of excited crowds. Event organiser Phil Taylor enjoyed cycling with his daughter and was pleased with the positive response to the event. It's an amazing cause with the rescue choppers, obviously, that you know it saves lives, so it's pretty easy to go out and raise money for them. It's a great, great crowd that we have, and we've got a lot of people that show up year after year. And of course we were lucky enough to have those three All Blacks this year, so it was a pretty special year. All the funds raised are set to support the Lakes District Air Rescue Trust, with the donations on track to set a new record of $110,000. In Invercargill, the South Today. FI Akane, still to come on Southern Newsweek. A determined Christchurch woman is on a mission to rescue turtles and find them new forever homes. And dogs getting fit on underwater treadmills in Dunedin, treating arthritis one step at a time. Welcome back. Dunedin Rally driver Emma Gilmore is celebrating after completing her first podium finish of the year in the Extreme E competition. It was a unique cause for Emma Gilmore and American co-driver Tanner Faust as the Extreme E Rally Series moved to Scotland. The off-road racing action took place in a former open-cast coal mine which proved a challenge for all competitors. The Neil McLaren team had a frustrating first round but bounced back on the Sunday with two strong qualifying heats. That saw the pair making their first grand final of the season. Conditions were extremely tricky, with wet weather and flying mud making for a slippery course, with visibility a major issue for all the drivers. Gilmore and Faust holding on to finish in second place, securing their first Extreme E podium of the year. Yeah, it was, it was tough. It was uh, a tricky track. The conditions were so changeable. So, so, so happy to be able to reward the team and all of their effort. After the wild ride in Scotland, the team has some time to recharge with the next round of the series in Sardinia, Italy in July. A Christchurch woman who takes in abandoned turtles is calling for would-be owners to educate themselves before taking them on as pets. Donna Moot says there's a lot of misinformation out there, with some breeders even sending turtles by post across the country. A collection of turtles of all shapes and sizes. Over more than 15 years, Christchurch woman Donna Moot has rescued hundreds of sick, injured or abandoned turtles that have been found in the Canterbury region. I get turtles from all over Christchurch, people find them and sometimes they're surrendered and they come here until I can get them rehabilitated and rehomed. She runs Turtle Rescue and Rehoming out of her Summerfield house. It's currently home to around 75 turtles. All the food, um, all the equipment I pay for myself. I'm very fortunate here that the Canterbury SPCA, they will um, support me with the stray turtles, so they'll help with vet bills for that. Over winter she can spend up to $1,000 a month on electricity alone, just to heat and run the myriad of water tank habitats throughout her home. 
She believes turtles make great pets, but is warning against misinformation from online sellers. I get a lot of turtles that have been bought on Trade Me, unfortunately. Many of them um, have significant shell injuries, uh, deformities, and um, are quite unwell because they've been given misinformation about how to actually care for them. Moot says people often don't realise that turtles have a lifespan of more than 50 years, meaning it's a long-term yeah. commitment. But she admits a big part of her work is supporting and educating new turtle owners. It's often easier for them when they know how big the tank has to be, how often to change the water, then they don't have all that stress and worry. She insists the shelled creatures are worth putting in the effort for and hopes improved education will help reduce the number of abandoned turtles rescued each year. In Christchurch, the South Today. Arthritis is a major issue for many older people, but it's also one of the most common diseases that dogs suffer from. Now, a canine hydrotherapy clinic is helping veteran dogs maintain their fitness in Dunedin by getting them to exercise underwater. Using the healing properties of water, this underwater treadmill is helping old dogs like 14-year-old Maddie keep their health rolling. Crystal Kelly co-owns of Aquapaws Hydrotherapy an underwater treadmill service provider for dogs in Dunedin. The clinic treats canines from around the city, suffering from old age and cruciate ligament diseases. It's the most beneficial for injuries and keeping older dogs mobile in a safe environment where they're not going to injure themselves further. Kelly says the rehabilitation industry for dogs internationally is far more advanced than it is here, although she believes we're now slowly catching up. The clinic sees around 40 to 50 dogs a week and the team reckon the dogs enjoy their therapy sessions. They not only enjoy it, but it helps strengthen them and keep, keep their mobility um, nice and supple, keep them moving and can help with the treatment of the injuries as well. Surprisingly, Kelly doesn't own any dogs herself, but insists she gets enough love from all the dogs she treats at her hydrotherapy clinic. In Dunedin, the South Today. Fiesta was the theme of this year's Waimumu art exhibition, which opened over Mother's Day weekend and closes tomorrow. The red carpet goes out in the small community for the annual event, which has attracted good crowds. Enjoying the large range of displays on offer from the rural artists of the region. The annual Waimumu art exhibition opened over Mother's Day weekend, with the Mexican-themed show proving a hit with visitors. The theme was inspired by guest artist Annie Bork, who was impressed with the work put into the community exhibition. I just celebrate these wonderful community women that have put this exhibition on. It's just fantastic. I love it. The materials the Waikaya artist works with are based off a rural upbringing. She likes to use white earthenware clay and wire to create her artworks. Bork says she really enjoys working with the mud and clay having done so since she was a kid. I uh, love it. I'll be making uh, and puddling in mud until I pass away and I've got another good 20 in me. Invercargill artist Lynn Grace was another guest at the Waimumu exhibition. Organisers are over the moon with how the five-day exhibition has gone, receiving amazing feedback after a sell-out crowd on opening night. In Waimumu, the South today. That wraps up this edition of Southern News Week. For the latest news and videos from the southern region, head online to odt.co.nz and you can follow Channel 39 on YouTube and the South Today NZ on Facebook to catch our news bulletins on demand. We'll see you again next week. Matawa. Public Interest Journalism, funded through New Zealand On Air.